so, so this is about uh, this course that we've been uh, running for 24 semester. Uh, we have more than 6,000 students, so now you can immediately calculate that we have uh, a lot of students every semester, uh, and we have to deal with this lot of students. Uh, my name is Tamás Ivány, and uh, we uh, run this course with my colleagues, Pál Danyi and Janos Vecsenyi. Um, we uh, show you a little bit about, uh, a little introduction about how this course works. So what can students get if they take this course? Uh, of course, we have uh, some lectures where they can get theoretical knowledge on entrepreneurship uh, with a lot of concepts. We are introducing them. Uh, on the other side, uh, we are introducing them the world of the startups and the entrepreneurs. So we are inviting famous Hungarian entrepreneurs to show how they started their, their life as, a, as an entrepreneur. Also, uh, there's an optional uh, pro program uh, connected to this course where they can get practical experience uh, of launching an, an enterprise. So this is a really complex program and uh, a really complex uh, lectures. And mainly the focus is on uh, giving them, giving the students a guidance uh, to carry a planning so they can answer the questions like, is this a job for me or is it worth launching a startup for my idea at the end of the, the, the semester. Um, based on this, uh, at the beginning, Janos uh, Vecsenyi uh, created uh, three ways how they can, how the students can can fulfill this uh, this course. Uh, we call it Sunday Hikers, Easy Riders, and Startup VIP program. Uh, let me just show you what this means. Uh, the Sunday Hikers are for the students who would like to get an introduction uh, to the startups and they don't want to really uh, make a, a lot of effort. Uh, the Easy Riders are the students uh, that uh, want to have uh, knowledge and willing to test their self in the field. And the Startup VIP program is for those students who want to uh, start their own business, they already have some ideas, or they would like to join a group. Uh, so based on this, uh, there are three ways the, how they can uh, fulfill the course. Uh, the Sunday hikers take a test at the end of the semester. The easy riders have to create a business concept by their own uh, at home uh, in a small group and they have to create a really short uh, pitch video. And uh, the Startup VIP is a program for the whole semester. Uh, they have to create a validated business concept in little teams and they have to do a pitch uh, a, a pitch. Uh, um, uh, so, so they have a pitch uh, competition at the end of the, the year. Um, so you can see we have three main ways how the students can, uh, can fulfill this course. But we were really interested if this is the real free way how, they should, uh, how we should manage the, the students. So uh, let me just show you the methodology of our primary research that we are uh, doing every year. We have an online survey that we are sending through our uh, uh, system, the Neptune system, to the students uh, at the beginning of the semester before the first lecture. Uh, uh, the methodology is based on convenience sampling, but you will see we have a really high uh, proportion uh, of the students who uh, fill this online survey. Um, and the main topics of this survey is the goals of the, the course, so why they choose the course, uh, why they think startups are important, and, and the skills of an entrepreneur, what do, you, what do they think, our students think, that uh, the entrepreneurs should have as a skill. Uh, we use semantic skills almost everywhere, uh, and that was really important for us to create uh, this uh, hierarchical uh, clustering that I will show you uh, based on these uh, topics. Um, just to show you the sample, um, here you can see uh, we have uh, courses every semester, around 1,050 to 300 students every semester, and all of the semesters uh, the sample uh, the sample percent was more than 50 percent, so more than 50 uh, percent of the of our students filled every semester uh, this online survey. 
Um, we have students from several faculties of the university, mainly faculty of the electrical engineering and informatics. Uh, here you can see in this diagram uh, the sample and the, uh, the, uh, the classes, uh, the, the proportion of the classes. So it's almost the same, actually. Um, we have six questions uh, based on their goals, uh, what they have to, what they would like to, to re achieve with these uh, uh, classes. Uh, here we just show you the, the main results of this uh, for uh, th six goals. Uh, we are really curious about if they would like to have a practical uh, course or a course about theory. We are really cu curious about if they would like to uh, work in team or work individually. Uh, we would also like to know if they are interested in conventional enterprises or knowledge-based enterprises. Uh, also, it's a really important question uh, if they would like to uh, actively pa participate in the classes or they would like just to listen to us or to the entrepreneurs that we are inviting. And also, it's really important to us to know that uh, if they would like to do some practical things during the semester or at the end of the semester, and, and at last but not least, uh, if they would like to do this course as a value of the knowledge, so they would like to get a real value, or they just easily uh, would like to easily obtain a mark and finish this class. Um, based on this, we uh, asked them, uh, which uh, track they would like to choose. And here you can see if we just uh, collect the data based on their choice, uh, there are really huge differences between uh, these, uh, 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 these uh, semantical skills. So for example, with the teamwork, uh, with the practical tasks during the semester or end of the semester, or also with the easily obtainable mark or the value of the knowledge. Uh, but this is the choice of the students. So this shows uh, what the students chose. We also create a clustering <coughs> uh, for understanding uh, how we can differentiate three really different uh, uh, groups of the students. Actually, we can call them the same way, but this was uh, the classification by the hierarchical uh, uh, clustering. And we found out that the main uh, parts are, this, are these. So for the Sunday hikers, we see that uh, knowledge is less important. They would like to have less participation during the lectures. They don't really need teamwork. And <coughs> practice is also less important. Not really important, but less important. Uh, for the easy riders, we see that knowledge is valuable. Uh, less participation, participation during the lecture they need. They also don't want really uh, teamwork, and they are really searching for practice. And the third one, which is the most important one for us, the Startup VIP program, uh, the knowledge is valuable for them. They want to participate in lectures, and uh, they really need teamwork, and they're really looking for practice. So let's see the differences between uh, what we created three groups on the clustering and what we uh, uh, what the students uh, um, uh, students um, uh, chose at the end um, here is just the same as the factors of the in differentiating as I mentioned but let me show you this uh, table so here you can see uh, what the students chose so what they would like to do during the class and what we got based on their needs uh, of the, uh, with the, the classification. And you can see we have three main groups. Uh, we have a group uh, uh, who choose according to their needs. Uh, that's not really a few students, uh, uh, um, luckily, but not so many. We also see that there are a really few students who choose a more complex way uh, to finish their course uh, than uh, what they need. And there are really a lot of students that we see who chose less complex way to finish their course. Uh, to show you the percentages, uh, it's almost 60% uh, who chose less than they need uh, 
uh, and we have around 40% uh, who chose according to their needs. So this is a really important question for us uh, that we see there are a lot of students who would like to uh, finish the lectures, finish the class uh, with a less innovative, less complex way. Um, we see actually no differences between the, the student, uh, between the, the terms, so between the semesters, uh, almost the same for the more complex, less complex proportion. Uh, even though we had the pandemic, we had a lot of uh, uh, different types of, of lectures during the pandemic, online, hybrid, offline lectures, almost the same every, every year. And we don't really see differences. So let me show you the, the implications uh, based on the, the primary research. Uh, we can see that the original concept by, by Janusz Vecsenyi professor uh, uh, was validated uh, with this word method. So we really have these three types of students. Uh, but we have to focus on uh, communication, communication and differentiation uh, based on teamwork participation in lectures and the value that they can gain during this course. Um, we also see that uh, based on this, uh, this, uh, these uh, results that the differences between the Easy Rider track and the Startup VIP should be more detailed for the students at the beginning. So they should, they should understand uh, it more uh, to, to choose the right way. And <coughs> With more accurate communication, uh, we think that uh, uh, this would help the students to find the perfect way to fulfill their course, because uh, we would like to transform those students who chose the less complex way to uh, their their needs, to choose the, to, to, to chose according to their needs. Uh, we have just really uh, simple implications for organizing the the, the courses for for entrepreneurship. Thomas. Uh, we are yeah, that's we, the last that's why I said good yeah so so we see that students are not uh, forming homogeneous groups uh, in this case uh, we have a lot of students and and we have to segment to do the segmentation and segmentation is inevitable for us and it can really help to to improve the efficiency of our education so yeah thank you very much for your uh, attention and if you have any question of course I would like to to answer the questions Thank you. Thank you, Tamas. Questions? Yes. yes. Can that be an online question as well? Ah, you hear us. Good. <laughs> so I'd like to ask uh, about the the, um, the grading system, or at least the credit that the uh, the students receive in this three different kind of path. Do they receive the same? Uh, ECTS, let's say, for the same course, even though they choose three different paths, uh, or do they receive something different as a as a credit score in, in the in the education system? Yes, originally uh, we gave them the same credits. Uh, but uh, about three years ago, we changed this because we also saw that uh, uh, sometimes they don't choose the, the harder way to, 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 to fulfill it because they feel uh, it's also the same, so the same credits, so also the same that they would uh, get. And uh, for those who, who choose the, the, the hardest program, the startup VIP program, uh, they get two more credits. Thank you. It's optional, of course. That, so, so, so the students can choose uh, if they would like to have the two more credits or not, but there are a lot of cases when they would like to have it. Yes? yes? I was wondering, uh, do you show these uh, results to the students? Or I, I, don't, I don't know when, when Not these results, but yeah. But, yeah. but, it, but like, like uh, you show them, and, and does it help them uh, Choose the, the right path? Well, uh, the first lecture is an introduction lecture for the students when we uh, give them a more detailed uh, introduction for, this th the, for the three uh, tracks. And also, we show them part of the results of the, the year's uh, survey. Uh, but there, we are mainly focusing on the skills of the, the entrepreneurs, what they think about their skills, what uh, they should uh, have as a skill as an entrepreneur or what are the goals of the entrepreneurs because um, because we would like to, to show them uh, what the class can give them.
More questions? Um, unfortunately, I don't see the hands of the crowd, so uh, I don't know if I'm interrupting someone or not. But I do have another question, if it's yeah, okay. yeah, please. Um, so I'm just wondering that if the students can choose this easy or the Sunday hardcap path as well, uh, can we not can we just um, how do we push them out of their comfort zone? Because if they can choose to stay in their comfort zone and not do any teamwork and just go through the course in, in the easy way, I think the learning outputs can be also um, um, a bit lower than if we push them out of their comfort zone. Just considering my example, when I was in university, let's say, uh, I was an introvert, a complete introvert, and uh, I would have chosen the easy hike, or the, the Sunday hike, or the easy path for sure, just get through because I was working part-time next to it as well. Uh, so, but I learned a lot of teamwork, communication skills, and so on, when I was pushed to do teamwork. Uh, so that's why I'm wondering if uh, there can be a higher learning output if we do uh, way to push them out of that comfort zone. Yes, uh, and, and we can also say uh, it's not really a comfort zone for them. So, so according to, to, the, to the clustering method, uh, we see that a lot of students are doing the test only, uh, <coughs> even though their needs is rather for teamwork or, or rather for participating actively in the lectures. So, so it wouldn't be such a, such a huge push uh, for them to, to, to push them out of the comfort zone. But, uh, but we would like to understand more uh, how, uh, why, why they choose the less uh, uh, complex way um, or, or how we can move them to the, to the, according to their flow. Thank you. We'd like to talk about as uh, approximately a 15 year old story. So we have been doing this for 15 years and it's going to be a real challenge to actually summarize it out somehow in, in, in 10 seconds, but I, give you, I, I will give you a try. Okay, so um, before this presentation, we talked about, a lot about different enterprises, startups, small and medium enterprises, and this kind of thing. What I'm going to talk about is a totally different kind of enterprise, a social enterprise. And uh, the thing what we did uh, is basically how you can involve uh, a university course into the development, ongoing development of social and entrepreneurship in a very poor community. Okay, so uh, to do that, uh, we have to go back uh, about 15 years and we have to go to Tomor. But the question is where, right? So let me help you a little bit. This is the Milky Way, right? And that's uh, our beautiful uh, green little ball there, the Earth, okay? Um, that's Europe. Here we are, Hungary, okay? And this is the map of Hungary. And what you can see uh, with uh, red uh, areas, these are the most depri uh, deprived region in Hungary, which means there is a lack of um, um, education there, there is a very high percentage of poverty there, the people usually live uh, 500 to 800 euro per month uh, with four or five children. In Hungary we have three million power people, li uh, people living in poverty. We have a 10 million um, uh, total, the Hungarians are 10 million and three millions of them are living in poverty. So it, poverty is an absolutely huge issue in Hungary. Uh, but if we compare this picture with those pictures where the Hungarian Roma are live, we're going to see a pretty same picture, right? Uh, so uh, usually in Hungary, those people who are affected by poverty and low-income families, uh, most of them are belong to the Roma uh, population as well. Uh, we work with a community up there in north, here and not far from Mishkoels. So that's the uh, small settlement where we are working, and it started 15 years ago. Uh, and it looks like this, so it's very beautiful. Uh, and uh, it's pretty hard to give you this kind of experience 
uh, how hard to live in a poverty like in this place. Okay, so it's really need a uh, uh, self experience to understand uh, how um, uh, the resources are uh, really lack of them. So that's why we started the whole thing uh, with a lot of um, uh, group based decision. Actually, it's me there. Uh, and we started working with, uh, with the, uh, the families, with the children, and we did a lot of projects, okay? So, and it go, went about eight, nine years or something like that, and we run a lot of different development uh, programs. And after this eight and nine years, it happened uh, that it created a pretty strong community, which were able to start thinking in an entrepreneurship way. Okay, so that's why we started our first uh, social entrepreneurship, which is called Romama. Uh, that's a Roma restaurant, which is actually uh, run. The idea was all the social, entrepreneur, uh, social enterprises, the basic idea behind of it is basically not making profit, rather making social profit. Okay, so all the ideas are coming from the community. The community are actually managing and own these kind of enterprises, okay? So this is really theirs, okay? And after that, uh, this is how it looks like, and after that we have, a, I don't know, movie night, uh, and after that it's uh, just like when you drop a little uh, stone into a lake, a lot of new ideas come up, and uh, because there are a, a lot of lack of services there, okay? And so transportation uh, enterprise uh, show that and this kind of thing. And, uh, and in this kind of context, there comes, came a university, okay, there's a, some uh, problem, which is called MOME. Okay, uh, I don't know whether I can uh, play a little video or not, but it's not really important. Um, the whole thing started with a summer camp. Okay, MoMA is an art university, so they are stu uh, uh, the, the students are not uh, don't have any kind of uh, business background or some kind of things. They are they are uh, a different type of uh, so they're learning different type of um, uh, design things. And what we did uh, first is to uh, create a one uh, week long summer camp for the children with the university student. The main idea behind it was to create trust. Because uh, when you want to work with a uh, community, when you want to work with people uh, who live in uh, poverty, it's the main concept is to gain the trust and to build this kind of trust. And we would have liked to build this trust to the children, and after that we can reach uh, the, uh, uh, the parents as well. Um, so we planned the course, uh, I mean this uh, one year long uh, summer camp, obviously together with, <laughs> with the community. And after that, it was pretty, pretty successful. So everybody loved it. Uh, the community loved it, the university student loved it, and this kind of song. We have the beautiful videos about that, so you can see it after that. Uh, and based on this kind of experience, we started thinking that, what if, if we started a course? Okay, so what if, if, we, if we not just uh, organize a summer camp, rather uh, we start a real university course from September? And then we started um, um, uh, planning it as well, together with the community. The idea behind it was that, as a lot of you are actually previously mentioned, uh, the uh, student formed um, a team and they started working with the entre entrepreneurs, okay, online. Because this settlement is 222 kilometers away from Budapest. So you cannot do this offline. But we had the, uh, avail uh, had the uh, uh, opportunity to bring all the students into the, uh, the town twice per, uh, per semester. And each and so, so both of them uh, took three days. So they could live with the families. They also could bring, uh, uh, do trust. They had this kind of experience, what is to be living in poverty, you know, because a lot of people doesn't have this, uh, unfortunately, doesn't have this kind of experience, okay? Uh, and uh, um, the, um, the, the student and the entrepreneur started to work together, okay? And each and every week, like, just like every university course, uh, we have this kind of uh, 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 course meeting when we try to do a training-based education, 
Okay, so, and we try to uh, bring up several different aspects, how you can work with the deprived uh, uh, families, how you can understand what they need is, how you can understand what an entrepreneurship spirit is, and how you can somehow cooperate and recreate and, uh, and think together uh, the, the thing, okay? Uh, we all obviously spoke uh, a lot of different uh, things like social entrepreneurship development, uh, Roma history, uh, human-centered design, social design, and so on and so on and so on, uh, which is obviously needed a lot of different tools, uh, what we used. Uh, the, uh, I think that uh, the businesses gained a lot of things. So first of all, they got a lot of beautiful design, <laughs> design ideas, but I think that's, that's just a tool. The main uh, thing what they gain a lot of connections and a lot of uh, um, resources what they could use after this course. Okay, uh, the student obviously learn a lot of, uh, about the disadvantaged situation in Hungary, uh, also learn a lot about how, what you can do, and also learn about how you can uh, work with an entrepreneur, okay? Uh, they created amazingly so many strong ties between the entrepreneurs and the students. And what, what is very important for me is they actually um, uh, persisted after the course, which is very, very important, okay? Um, the best of our, uh, my knowledge, this is the only course in Hungary which has ever tried to um, uh, involve uh, university students uh, to work with disadvantaged uh, communities and uh, create and help social entrepreneurship somehow. So I don't know anything uh, more, uh, uh, much more about that. Uh, and they obviously used a lot of uh, very well-known uh, tools like BMC and uh, social uh, design toolkits. Uh, unfortunately, COVID came and uh, we couldn't um, go further after that because it is really, really needed this kind of two uh, uh, segments in a course that the student can, you know, live and work and think and uh, be uh, active together with the community. And the COVID just, you know, uh, just erased this kind of opportunity. So uh, we not follow this course after that. Uh, we don't know what the future comes, or what the future holds, so we really hope that, uh, that uh, it's gonna continue. And there, it, it, there is another um, uh, a song at the end, but I cannot play it. If you don't mind, I, I can try it, it's not really important. Uh, what I would like to uh, uh, tell you that it's, it's not a success story. <laughs> so it's not a success story. We don't have this kind of uh, 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 very easily followable tools in our hands, what you have to do and you can do everywhere. Obviously not. That was something like a roller coaster. Something has worked, something didn't work, okay? And, uh, and I just would like to give you this kind of sense that, that it can be worked. So you can do it. The university can do it. And even if the university has a very rigid uh, um, institutional context, it's still able to help and, and work together with, uh, with low-income families and create some very beautiful things. Okay, so thank you so much, and this, is this was my presentation, and I hope I made it in time. I don't know. Almost. Almost. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Martin. You're welcome. Questions? Yes. Why exactly Tomar? Why exactly that relation? Yeah. Or it was accidental? No, 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 no. Uh, I'm a social developer, so I have been uh, um, uh, fostering uh, social enterprises since I don't know where. And, uh, and one of the very important thing is when you're working with the community is that uh, it cannot be... Uh, so the, the Tomar community is not as poor as other part of uh, of the uh, of the bullshit. So there are much worse, uh, I mean financially and contextually, a much worse place in Bolshoi. And it was even hard to the student to realize this kind of situation. And if we bring them to an even, you know, uh, a harder situation, it, it, it could be more, even more challenging. So that's why, that's why. 
And, and there were a lot of social business ideas there, which actually needed some kind of a design element and this kind of thing. So, so that was the other part, because, you know, that's, that's, so they needed a logo, needed a brand, needed uh, a, a Facebook campaign, needed some kind of a, a visibility and this kind of thing. So that's why. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, very interesting presentation. But um, would you not argue that um, there is something called, as I do, informal entrepreneurship? Because yeah. these people who you're dealing with, I would assume, um, are not paying tax and social security, all that sort of thing. Oh right? yeah. Um, yeah. So I didn't have I didn't have time to to, to speak all about. All right. All yeah. Those. Okay. But no. Anyway. These are not important. Okay, uh, I myself am doing research into something called informal entrepreneurship, yeah, which is not quite the same as social entrepreneurship. Yeah, and I'm doing it with Roma communities here in Budapest who collect rubbish off the street in oh, cool. you know, this practice called Lontane Tash, uh -huh. which is municipal rubbish yeah, collection. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and they salvage and collect stuff, and they might make money out of this. So yeah, I sure. should suggest is entrepreneurship already exists. Yeah, sure, sure. So that's that's, that's totally fine. So I uh I, I nurture this in different yeah. directions. Yeah. So the thing is that, that there are so many different ways how you can uh develop social enterprise. One is when you start it from the idea, but the other thing is when there are some informal tons of informal uh social entrepreneurs who are actually working uh in these villages and the and, and started working with them to, you know, to create a formal entrepreneur, uh, enterprise yeah. out of it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it isn't. Is um, you know, we tend to think in terms of this dichotomy that, you know, if something is a social enterprise, it must be formally registered, yeah. you know, to be doing something yeah. good. But informal people are doing it as well. You should, For sure. example, we have a Roma here in the Longton in Itash. They might be stripping TV tubes out yeah. and all that sort of thing. Yeah. And taking so out copper on that wire and all that sort of stuff, which is actually helping the yeah. environment. Yeah, in some I'm working cases. in, in, in Chengita for um, five years or something like that, and we created some kind of enterprises based on these uh, long, uh, longish uh, thing mm. that you just mentioned. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, the, this is a, a little, a, about a little bit of different because because I, I, I would love to, to, to speak with you about this because uh, social, developing social enterprise is amazing, but I really would have liked to bring something uh, which actually incorporate the university teaching into this process. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm pretty sure that uh, that something is pretty feasible to do something like that with the informal entrepreneurs as well. Mm -hmm. But I'm not quite sure that you can do it with the uh, design student. You really need some kind of, um, I don't know, business background or, uh, or student who have different ideas. I don't know. So, but, but you know, so this is a little bit different story. But, Slightly. But, but, yeah. but I get you. Mm -hmm. Professor Yanush, yes. Um, it was great. Thank you very much for the contribution. I uh, just wonder, what if you are alone and you have other interests to go forward? Who would follow? Who would start or initiate such programs in that region and other regions? We need institutions behind or even entrepreneurship behind because it Otherwise, it's just the Don Quixote effect. It's just one single program. It's okay. just a single program. Mm -hmm. Do you teach it, let's say, in the Mishkos University? Uh, Do you teach it in Debrecen, in Nyiregyháza? Mm -hmm. so and encourage people to yeah. found their own foundation which would follow this concept and help people to so there are two ways which we are actually working on uh, one way is to one man to another so when something like this happens in a village it's pretty fast that uh, the next village or people from the next village starting coming up with a with an idea and restarting this whole process from the validation and so on and so on. this kind of thing the other thing is 
uh, that I am actually currently uh, I'm speaking with the, the University of Mishkoet, with the anthropologists there, and they are pretty interested to incorporate this kind of uh, uh, technique into into their uh, course material. I'm 100% on your side that it is really needed some kind of institu institution to get behind of this. I hope that MoMA was this kind of institution, but COVID started, you know, and and uh, and so I don't know. And continue. And oh, m maybe we will. So yeah. that's that's the question. And maybe it's better to work with uh, the Michigan University because it's much, you know, closer to these settlements. We're and gonna try see. Try Niretas as well. Or maybe Niretas. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite familiar with Savoy. I worked there a little bit, but not really. <laughs> we will see. We will see. Okay, we will see. So thank you. Just a quick recommendation on that. Uh, a follow up on that. Uh, Google actually run uh, a very good tender which would fund uh, similar uh, initiatives actually. Last year there was a very good tender where a uh, university consortia could apply to, to target these kind of programs uh, where uh, it's targeting entrepreneurial uh, initiatives in disadvantaged regions with university collaborations. That's pretty, pretty amazing. Could you send me the link, please? I, I'm gonna... Yeah, uh, 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 I, I uh, here is my... Uh, 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 I don't know uh, whether I can, I can show my email address, but could you do that? It's uh, gostony.martin uh, at unibga.com. That who? Okay, could you, could you send sure it to me? Amazing, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Thank you very much for inviting me. My name is Johanna Wiesner. I'm from Vienna University of Economics and Business. And today I'm presenting the Entrepreneurship Avenue, which is an event series designed for students. <clears throat> and this is basically our cross cross disciplinary approach um, for entrepreneurship. And I would like to start with the problem statement when we um, actually established the Entrepreneurship Avenue what we were facing. So in 2014, we have seen there are several needs in regard to entrepreneurship education. Only 2% of Austria's uh, students actually have the opportunity to engage in any entrepreneurial activities. And that actually is a signal for us that is actually too little. Also, uh, back in the days, there was no cross-university networking, which means students didn't have the opportunity to meet students from other academic backgrounds to build interdisciplinary teams. And also, third, even though there were very great and prominent programs and formats in the ecosystem targeted to startups, there were none that are really suited to young students and are on a very early stage level. <coughs> So with that being said, we actually created some of our guiding beliefs, meaning we think that a greater pro proportion of students need to become aware of entrepreneurship, that it is an attractive career path and what they can do with it. Also, if students have the playground to try out entrepreneurship, they gain confidence and self-belief, which in, in action turns to more startups and greater success of the startups. Also, great business ideas come from interdisciplinary collaboration. It is important to have several skill sets within a team. Um, learning also includes testing, failing, and iterating. And for us, it is important to have a supportive environment. Founders inspire founders. It is important to be on, the sub and on an equal level um, and have people inspiring other founders on this level and when we're talking about the ecosystem it's also important that the economy actually needs continuous reinvention which is basically led by startups and innovation and people in our society also require inspiring and meaningful work with these guiding beliefs we actually created our purpose of the Entrepreneurship Avenue and our program. So what do we want to do and what are we actually doing? We are creating awareness. We show students that no matter what they study, will it be medi medicine, economic, art, every student can be an entrepreneur. It is for their profit and also for societal profit. We want to stimulate growth. We want to encourage everyone and learn 
uh, teach them new skills and show them what entrepreneurial thinking and acting is. We also introduce them to skills, meaning entrepreneurial skills in regard to uh, learning about the practices, but also applying them in in um, in in in, in, um, in an environment. Um, fourthly, we encourage collaboration because we are in in, in an interdisciplinary uh, setting. We want students to work together in, in teams in regard to not only only business people, but very diver- diverse team. It is also very crucial to us that we provide a platform that is fun, engaging and dynamic, but still in an authentic and professional way. And we are leading our participants to actually take action. Of course, they can talk a lot about their idea, but in the end, we really want to encourage them to take action and turn their ideas into viable businesses. So the Entrepreneurship Avenue is Europe's largest startup event series for students. It is designed to uh, inspire, encourage, and support students to join the startup scene. Our DNA with this program is to have a very low barrier entry for several target groups, meaning students that want to receive inspiration, encouragement, but also want to learn about entrepreneurship and being supported in a pre-acceleration program. And last but very not least is the interdisciplinarity and cross-university positioning of our program. As I said, it is very crucial to us to have this approach from several academic backgrounds to unite several universities and actually provide this as as the base for for a lot of um, um, student startup teams. So our main target groups are, of course, students, but we can divide them into entrepreneurs, meaning students that know about entrepreneurship, they know about the concept, and they are really dedicated to found their company one day. And then we have these explorers. These are students that do not have um, a lot of uh, know-how about entrepreneurship, maybe haven't heard about it before, but still they are curious and want to learn about that. So these explorers, we want to inspire them, show them what entrepreneurship is, and ideally turn them into entrepreneurs so that they can found their companies, build build their their projects basically, and take action. So our program program outline from 2014 until now hasn't really changed. So we will always start with a kickoff event, which is mainly based on inspiration, showing what entrepreneurship is, showing that entrepreneurship has many facets no matter what you study. Then we are diving deeper into our lab series. It is a series of four workshops, as we call them. And within interdisciplinary team settings, we introduce students to entrepreneurship and help them gain hands-on experience. So this is the action and doing part. And last but not least, our very, very big highlight of this event is a conference. It's a final full day uh, conference um, located in Vienna, full of inspirational keynotes, uh, the Pitch Award. And this is the place to be, to, to, be, to, to dive into the startup ecosystem, but also get the chance to, um, to receive visibility with the startup, but also be connected. So we start with the kickoff in regard to inspiration. We have the lab series for taking action and the, the connection part with the conference where we have a lot of um, participants there or, or attendees, more than 1,000 uh, attendees, and connect them with the startup ecosystem. So how do we organize that? We have two uh, co-founders and two co-organizers of the Entrepreneurship Avenue. It is the ECN. The ECN is a cross-disciplinary or a cross-university network in Austria, which is basically the faculty level. And on the other hand, we have the students level from the SIMC. SIMC is a master program at the University of Economics and Business in Vienna. And I am part of the ECN faculty, meaning we comprise the founders and the organizers of, of this event series, and we are in constant exchange with the students that are coming from SIMC. So we recruit from this master program um, two head organizers, two students that are in charge and leading leading the entire organizing team. The organizing team comprises around 30 to 40 students that are 
organizing the entrepreneurship avenue on a voluntary basis. The organizing team changes every year, so we have quite a dynamic change there. And we as the faculty are here to uh, take a look that uh, the DNA remains the same and that we can actually um, grow uh, every year. So here are some numbers um, from 2014 until now, um, we had more than 11,000 participants <clears throat> that were um, actually active in our program. Uh, also, our interdisciplinary focus is growing and we are very happy to do so. Um, this year, we actually have more than 70 universities represented. Also, um, since we entered this year the ninth round of the Entrepreneurship Avenue, we established a community of mentors, experts from the startup ecosystem of more than 500 people. Uh, of course, we are all about startups. We have successful startup stories in our program, um, especially Refurbed and Hockeyfy, but in total more than 250 startups were founded. And in 2017, we received international recognition because we were awarded with the AACSB as the only European program out of 120 applications. Since we were talking about internationality, um, this year we were quite honored that the uh, Joint Chamber of Commerce from Iran and Austria showed interest in our program. And they said they want to send uh, Iranian students to the startup, uh, to the Entrepreneurship Avenue, and actually created a preparation program so that their students can uh, actually participate in the international setting. When we're talking about internationalization, um, due to the COVID situation, we had to shift um, the, on, the, the, the program fully online, but that actually increased our internationality. Right now, since we, 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 we established and, and, and handled the situation quite well, we now have hybrid events, so some parts online, some parts in person, because we think with this hybrid setting, we can allow many students to, to participate, but also it is important to have this in-person connection. Also, last but not least, one very um, interesting fact is that this year the first franchise entrepreneurship avenue is happening because we have we took the format and someone in ghana some um some partner universities are actually executing the entrepreneurship avenue in accra last but not least um, I'm, I'm about to sum up my learnings that i want to share with you throughout the nine years that we have uh, gained so far so it is important when we are working as a faculty together with students, it's important to work towards a common goal. It is important that everyone is on the same page and what you get from the students, the student startup teams, even though if they are changing every year, they're super motivated and they are working with you with a strong dedication to the, to the same goal. Staying true to yourself, even though we are developing each year, we still keep our position in being an early stage in interdisciplinary program. So we remain to our DNA. Uh, thirdly, communication in several languages is, is important. Because we are attracting students from various academic backgrounds, it is important that we differentiate the communication to these target groups because art students are, for example, not attractive, attracted by the terms entrepreneurship and startup. And last but not least, do not take anything for granted. Even though we've established strong relationships and have a strong position, we have to communicate every year and to start promotion from scratch. And this is something, um, nothing we take for granted, but still this is a lot of effort that goes into that. With that being said, thank you very much for providing us the opportunity to present the Entrepreneurship Avenue to you. Um, this is our team, Rudolf, Monique and myself. Unfortunately, I cannot be present in, in Budapest this time, but Monique is now in, a, in another section presenting something, so feel free to reach out to her in the coffee break. And now I'm happy to, to get any questions from the audience. So we can start with the questions. Yes, Professor. What is the key to success? What are the ultimate reason that this program is successful? I'm sorry, I do not understand the questions. Could you, Ned, repeat or maybe hand over the mic? That would be fantastic. I will hand over. It's easier. Uh, 
Hi, congratulations to the uh, program. I just have a minor question, Joanna. What is the secret of success? Um, the secret of success is probably that um, even though we have an innovative or, or a program for innovation, we are innovative ourselves. So we do not, we, we still stick to our DNA, but we redefine the program every year and see what are the needs in the market, what do students want. We adapt every year and the program seems to be uh, familiar each year, but still it is different in its core. And I think another secret sauce is probably that we have a strong team that is very dedicated and motivated towards um, working uh, to the goal. And actually, um, I think what is also what might also be a success is that the students that attended as a student startup team in, in the past, they are now about to become unicorns or already are unicorns and they are still referring to being part of the entrepreneurship avenue and I think this is a, a nice word of mouth that that is happening and and providing us as success well it's it's great so uh, I wanted to ask the follow-up question of the measure of success but you just mentioned the unicorns how many unicorns you can grow uh, in this avenue, I didn't. Do you have asphalt on the avenue or um, grass? So, we, so for us, it is important as a very early stage program to um, provide as many students as possible with the program, with providing them a, a playground to try out entrepreneurship firsthand. So this is basically one of our key KPIs. And of course, if a lot of startups come out there. We are super proud of that and happy to do so. But we are not measuring directly on how many unicorns are, are about to come. Of course, there are some that are coming, but I think it also takes time. I mean, this year is only the ninth year we are doing the Entrepreneurship Avenue, and I think it will take five or ten more years um, to have more unicorns there because we are so early stage. And um, after completing our program, it takes a couple of more months or uh, around a year uh, until the, the teams are really founding their company. Oh, by the way, who would finance this avenue? Road um, making is quite uh, resourceful endeavor. So how can you finance this avenue? We're happy to have very strong partners. So, um, as, 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 as you have it with the New Cup conference, we are happy to have sponsoring partners uh, on the other side, and they are actually financing um, the, the, the program. All right. Thank you. And good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? I have a quick one. Uh, can, because you are running that for several years, can you just give us what was the, the biggest challenge in, in the running program? Um, the biggest challenge is, um, I mean, we had one of the biggest challenge when, when COVID hit, basically, because we had all of the not, events not in that person <laughs> at several universities, and that was actually something, can we still make sure that the people are attracted to this program, because most of the people attended because of the network, and it's hard to um, to have this this, this uh, networking part in an online setting, but what is always a, a challenge or, or something that we want to tackle every year is because we have the students in the organizing team, we always have to make sure that we are on the same page, that everyone knows what is what is the USP of the Entrepreneurship Avenue and, and that we are all working towards a, a, a common goal. So it is really um, a, a challenge basically each year to onboard the students well enough so that they can um, basically create the avenue. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, do you hear me well? First, I would like to apologize for my unorganized sentences. Uh, it's 4 a.m. here. I'm living in Vancouver, Canada. So uh, now the night is catching up with me. <laughs> So I might lose my thoughts sometimes, but I will catch up, I promise. Um, so I'm going to just share my screen. Uh, 
I think that's the easiest. If I already ish, yeah, I can. Already, I'm already sharing my screen, if I believe. So uh, today I'm going to talk about um, one of these research projects that we did internally in our organization uh, when we figured out uh, what are the uh, the big challenge before COVID hit. Obviously, we also suffered uh, a bit of ch challenge there. But what what were the biggest challenges? in our short-term entrepreneurship programs. Uh, just a bit of background uh, um, about us, what we do, and so on, uh, so the context is clear. Uh, we are very much resonating with the entrepreneurship avenue. Uh, we are running uh, entrepreneurship education programs in uh, more than 20 countries, starting from MIT, uh, Boston in, in, uh, in the US, to all the way to Japan um, with Google together. Uh, so we are running with, I think, now more than 25 universities actively, uh, entrepreneurship education programs and uh, large organizations like Google and Microsoft as well. So all of these programs are challenge-based learning. Uh, they are varying from three days uh, to two weeks to a full semester course as well, uh, coming with a lot of uh, guest lectures and uh, and mostly learning by doing. So the lecturing part is actually the least which happens in our programs. And here are just some pictures about uh, some recent events from Barcelona, Ljubljana, and in, from the USA as well. Um, so what we realized in these programs uh, that um, there is a certain pattern uh, was forming in each of these events, uh, then there were some teams which were performing really, really well, and some were just lacking behind, even though we saw the potential and the idea was really great as mentors ourselves, as coaches, we saw that there could be way more coming out from those teams as well, and they we also wanted to improve on that as uh, that a little bit. So we turned things around a little bit, and we put ourselves into the, again, in the entrepreneurship journey, so we went through the, the lean process to validate uh, the problem of our own uh, and validate if it's existing in multiple other programs as well, not just uh, there is a problem with us. And uh, we started to dig deeper and deeper into this topic. And then we realized uh, that this need is uh, popping up or this problem is popping up um, in all across Europe first and then uh, across the globe as well. Then we, uh, scaled it up to the other continent as well. Uh, so, uh, what was the biggest finding of this of this issue is is actually the team dynamics or the lack of it. So, what we realized if we create teams, because in some educational progresses we have 500 students arriving to the uh, for, for our programs, let's say, in, uh, an event in Paris, which was only three days of an education, more like a raising awareness of entrepreneurship uh, to get to the entrepreneurs to quote the previous speaker. Uh, there, obviously, timing is pretty short. And if time is lost while, let's say, two hustler type person is really pushing their own idea and they cannot go forward with the idea because um, they always have their own belief and, and where, where does the idea should go and it's very hard to negotiate inside a team. That can be a, a, a pretty frustrating. Obviously, if it's a semester-long project, it's le less of an issue because there is time to figure out how the team is working together. But if you just craft a team quickly, right before the event, uh, this can cause the hiccups. Uh, so that was our findings first on the need or the problem uh, itself. So then again, we went uh, to our background. I myself, uh, I finished my PhD studies in, in machine learning in process mining. So that's why you see this process uh, models there. So we went back to the drawing board as entrepreneurs to figure out, okay, what are these processes? Who is going through? Obviously, the event organizers, we went through, okay, what are the path of organizing such an event? Then. What other business coaches are doing um, to guide through the whole idea or the ideation process and the pitching and the participants. What is the process of the participants and see where we can improve, where we can figure out new, new methods. So when we had the oversight um, of, of what the activities are, which happening in an event, again, from a step back, then we realized that, okay, uh, we, should, we need to build uh, an MVP first 
to figure out okay if our assumptions are correct and uh, uh, this team building mechanism can fix these issues of of the hiccups in the end of the ideation of the quality of the idea in, in, in uh, some cases of the teams so what we did we created a team tool um, I have a software development firm as well uh, that is based in Hungary um, so I gave the task for the MVP for my employees they developed my uh, the tool for us and then we started to validate with our uh, uh, partners and this tool in the early stages didn't have the machine learning part it right now it has uh, so uh, I might need to update my slides about that but the main uh, the core idea of this thing is the archetype detection. So we have these entrepreneurial archetypes. There is a lot of research about this. Obviously, most of us heard about the, the hacker, hipster, hustler, hound, uh, the 4-H, or the uh, build for growth from, from Stanford, uh, or, uh, or the LOGB, uh, the, this lobby uh, personality test as well, um, and the other leadership uh, personality or archetypes. Uh, then we combine some of these researches, which is on the market, uh, on, on the market with my uh, researcher background a little bit, and then we crafted uh, an MVP, a questionnaire. Uh, so first, obviously, we have to validate if the questions are giving the, the right archetypes. Uh, so we went through several validation around in our summer schools and winter schools to see if this archetype is matching. So the coaches were validating that with control groups. We figured out, okay, that is working. Okay, let's see if it's improving the, the mechanism uh, in, in, the, in the team dynamics. So what we did was we built in this team tool as well is challenge allocation because one of the other key aspects of a successful idea or a successful team dynamics is, is the passion. Like in every startup, uh, if you have the passion, it's a way higher chance that uh, you, will, you will get to a, a level when you get through the difficulties as well. Like in team dynamics, some difficulties can happen, but if the passion is shared with the team, then you can get through it. Uh, so we made sure uh, when we have, let's say, a 500 student event, when we have 50 challenges uh, at least, um, or 100 challenges, more likely, if it's 500, uh, then we only show uh, challenges on, on, on our platform uh, that the students can choose themselves, which is still available for them. So there is no uh, disappointment. So we created um, um, a function that is checking the archetypes and the diversity of the traditional diversity measures as well. If this team, if this person is fitting this challenge still as uh, or not. Uh, so if it's not, then it's all not, not visible already for the participant. So they can allocate themselves into teams and ch to, for, to challenges uh where they are passionate about and they fit with the archetype to the team dynamics as well and then this team also has business coach management which helps us for the research part where we are validating um uh the the concept behind and now uh after a while we, we built in machine learning um to further improve this archetype detection so there is a reinforcement learning going on in the background where the coaches are setting um personalities with every coaching session, he, uh, the coach is uh, setting up the personality um, skill levels on, on leadership, on communication, um, or research background, and so on. So th these skills are set up and this, uh, re this is reinforcing the, uh, the archetype matching. So if, if the questionnaire mismatched somehow or miscategorized the, the, uh, the participant, then the machine is learning behind. So in this research setting, in the first round, we just run in 12 events with more than 1,000 participants uh, with uh, yeah, more than 20 nationalities in five different countries. Um, each event was in between three to 14 days, just to set different settings as well. And they had control groups. So 60% of the teams were created by the team tool and 40% were by the traditional diversity measures like uh, gender, major, uh, nationality, and uh, for example, uh, location where they come from at the moment. It's, it's, well, most of the time is different, by the way. They, our students are living somewhere else than their nationality. Um, so then uh, we run these control groups as well. And what was important, how we evaluated uh, our, our model 
behind is uh, the business coaches were one of the evaluators, the jury members, and the participants themselves. So the, uh, the business coaches didn't know which teams were created by the tool or uh, which were the control groups, and the jury members neither. So their feedback, obviously, through the processes, the, the business coaches gave us feedbacks of which teams worked very well with the team dynamics and which teams didn't. The jury members obviously scoring the ideas and the and the progress of the teams in the end of the challenges, and the participants themselves give a feedback on on, on how well their team teamwork is, and they compare that to previous uh, years of uh, events. So well, the results were pretty <laughs> interesting. Uh, Ninety-four percent of the uh, uh, the results from the coaches showed that they identified which are the better teamwork. So the the higher uh, the better teamworks teams were the ones which were created by the team tool in ninety-four four percent of the time. And the the projects came came out of the whole thing were, were higher quality that we received the feedback from the organizers that in in these events. They, the outcomes were even uh, better quality than, than the last years. Um, the participant ratings of the events uh, were outstanding uh, because they enjoyed the, the whole challenge way better because they had a shared passion and also immediately they clicked together, at least that's what they said, in the team dynamics. Uh, so, and the winning teams of these competitions were all coming out from the team to build teams because they could do more in the same amount of time. So, but I guess I'm running out of my time, so yeah. I just jump into the <laughs> conclusions and then we can continue the discussion uh, with, with, the, with the q and I hope I shared all, all the things I wanted because the 10 minutes is come and uh, I just stopped sharing my screen. Okay. Thank you, Balash. We can start with the questions. Yes, Paul. Hello, Balaj. Congratulations. It's a great talk. Uh, my question is, um, you mentioned that you have teams all over the world. How can you cope yes. with the cultural differences? And uh, what about the, the, the culture aspect? Mm -hmm. Actually, uh what is pretty interesting is, um, is it is pushing the teams out of their comfort zone. So as I said, the traditional measures were already the uh, the diversity from, from nationality and localization where they live as well. So that includes the, the cultural background, let's say coming from Spain to have a bit more uh, chill uh, uh, work um, um, tempo or work momentum as well. Um, compared to, let's say, uh, a very much focused Finnish uh, method. Uh, I was living in Finland as well, and, and I also uh, love the talk of the first presenter, by the way. So um, what, what was interesting for me uh, to see in, in, in these setups, even when people, for example, at MIT, people are coming from all over the world for our project, what we are running at MIT, is actually this cultural diversity is giving an advantage to the teams because uh, they have a different view, obviously, on the, on the problems themselves. So they can um, they can see the problem from different point of view. So their ideas are covering a larger uh, audience as well. Um, and uh, luckily, we didn't have much issues. Uh, usually, the I, I think the the bigger issues came from team in team dynamics, where people were in the same team from the same country or from the same culture, uh, because then they then the communication in between them could be even in a, uh, a more equal level, let's say, and then there is no decision maker, there is no leader in the communication, no leader in the team. Uh, it happens in a lot of cases, especially when obviously friends try to join the same team. Thank you. More questions? Okay, yeah. Please ask about the methodology differences in the different countries. Um, I'll ask you about the methodologies uh, for different countries, right? Using different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, methodologies on like how do we run our entrepreneurship events or for the methodology differences? Mm -hmm. So um, we are pushing the, this challenge based learning method and pushing people out of their comfort zone in, in each of these uh, uh, countries. We don't 
we sometimes have to adapt a little bit. Let's say talking about Japan. Uh, in, in Japan, the the introvert levels are, are very higher, so that is less likely to have leaders or hustlers in the teams and so on. So we have to really push with the coaching to make people speak up more. And but. Uh, for example, in our events, when there are a lot of introverts in the country, what we do is we have every day the random pitching, which they start the day when they have to pitch about the, their yesterday progress, like a, uh, an agile meeting, uh, focusing on one certain topic, let's say market research or uh, business model or, or the validation themselves or the problem. And this random is rolling the dice. They don't know the model behind. They have to figure out until the end of the event. But in the end, we make sure that these uh, roll the dice methods make everyone from the team speak up and have a pitching uh, session at least. So everyone is pushed out of their comfort zone. Uh, we really make sure that um, just for my passion about, because I was an introvert myself. Uh, I, I'm a computer scientist uh, by training. Um, and I have four companies now uh, running uh, in, in machine, from machine learning to software development to education um, in, in three different countries now. Uh, so how did I develop on this process? Uh, I was pushed out of my comfort zone a lot of times. So I really want to give the same opportunity and, uh, to other uh, similar uh, students who I, but like I was like 10, uh, more like 12 years ago now. So uh, we try to push the same method, or we apply even more pushing out of the comfort zone in some cultures, like, like uh, for example, the, the Asian cultures. Thank you. Uh, any, any, anyone else? Uh, I have a question, actually. Uh, so basically, the, 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 your presentation is like team dynamic optimization in short-term entrepreneurship programs. Um, do you have opportunity to see what is happening on the long-term basis? Uh, usually, we didn't see the same problem uh, developing in a one-year-long project or a, or a half-year-long project because, uh, because then the team had time to adjust and get used to each other. So even if, if there were like two hustlers in the same team in the beginning, uh, that is always an alpha, yeah, just uh, from going back to our roots. Uh, so in a, in a long, longer process, this alpha turns out to be the leader and also the coaches help to guide, obviously, because everyone needs to learn. So even the, the hustler who is always talking is forced to listen. Uh, so we make sure that the, the people who are always talking, whenever we have a question in the coaching session, always talking, we make sure that make that those people also listen uh because obviously if you say what you know already you don't learn anything new well basically my experience is a bit different so basically we had like uh, a, a really good setup at the beginning of the program and or the startups actually it's not just the program uh and then after like a couple of months then the problem starts because you have maybe two alphas so and one alpha does want to to go back so uh and everything looks fine at the beginning and this is like a, mm -hmm. also a cultural thing, I, I guess. You know, everyone wants to work fine at the beginning, but later when the machine start hitting, then then the problems uh, actually came out of the out of the box. Yeah. Also depending on the on the on the audience as well. So if you are let's say having a program for uh, in a business school, uh, then yeah. you more likely have more hustlers. Obviously, like pretty homogeneous, actually, I think like 60, 70 percent hustlers uh, who, who like to speak up, who like to pitch. Uh, our audience is usually STEAM, STEM plus arts. So it's um, more uh, computer scientists, engineers, uh, mathematicians, uh, forest engineers so on, uh, and, uh, and arts, arts as well. Nowadays, we, we picked up art. So... Uh, there, they have less hustlers, uh, so that might cause a difference in this long term as well. If if you are working with with uh, already entrepreneurial minded people, uh, but I would be curious to figure out if the tool can help in the long term as well. Yeah, maybe. We, okay, we will connect and we can we can talk uh, later about uh, co 